Yeah, well, we start, so our, my shift, at, actually we start a little later in most of the early morning shifts. So some of the reporters in town, like Channel 2, 4, 5, 11, they start, they get at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Those are the breaking news guys. And my shift is a little weird because I mostly do features. So I get in at a, a little before 5.30, and then my, I do two live segments, one at 7 and one at 8. And, one, and both of them are typically, you know, like, f for instance, the last two days I was at Yankee Stadium for opening day. One day it got rained out. And then the next day, we actually played, they actually played the game. Today, I was at an old-fashioned ice cream parlor in Queens that it was the last one of a chain that there was once 30. It was called Jans. It was like one of those you know, old-school old ice cream places where you get a big Sundays and all have funny names, and you go there with your family for birthdays and after ballet recitals and things like that. And there's literally one left. So I interviewed the owner. He made a uh, chocolate egg. You guys know what egg cream is? New York? Yeah. He made an egg cream for me. He made this giant ice cream soda. I was drinking it on the air. Anytime I can eat on the air, it's always a good thing. I've eaten the Pope cookie this year. I've eaten the Mets World Series cookie. I was actually was spitting out crumbs at my photographer. It was kind of embarrassing. Food is always good and fun. People, people you know, dig food, uh, these days especially. I don't know, food is like with all the food channels and everything, people go crazy. So, you know, we've done restaurant week, and the guy made me eat. Oh, <laughs> you guys know the seven fishes? It's very like New York City Catholic thing, but... The seven fishes is like a feast you have on Christmas Eve when you're not eating. So I went to this place in Brooklyn called Octopus Garden, and, and most of the time it's wholesale fish so store, but on the week before, they sell to the public. Octopus, all kinds of weird things. I had, so I ate sea urchin on the air, which is like this kind of, it's, so the guy, the owner of the store, like scooped it out for me on, while I was doing on TV. And he said, hey, Raj, try this, you old school Brooklyn guy. And I was like, uh... Okay, <laughs> and I, so, but that, that makes good TV, because people are like, oh, what, you know, what face is he going to make? Is he going to like it? Is he going to hate it? Is he going to spit it out? Is he going to puke? You know, <laughs> so it's, I always try and set myself in the positions where it's going to be something that's entertaining, whether, and, and I don't care if I make a fool out of myself, because that's just how it is. People like it, you know, I mean, people like it. There's going to be a couple of people like, oh, this guy's an idiot. Oh, God, I can't take, but the res overall response, the overwhelming response is people like get a kick out of it. Now look at me, obviously I'm not the greatest physical condition. So you make me play sports or do something physical, it's funny. <laughs> I mean, it's like, that's it. You know, most people are like, oh my God, what, yeah. So that's, I mean, I try and always, and then so what happens is, so I do the two live segments and then it's package time. And New York One, they give us a little more leeway than a lot of the other stations. We get two minutes. Just under two minutes. You don't want to go, you can't go over two. A lot of the other stations, mostly they get like 115 for the most part. Um, so I have a little more leeway to have some fun and do a good stand-up where I could do, so if I'm doing something like I was doing today, obviously I'm at an ice cream shop, right? Well, you know, I'm beating a Sunday for my stand-up. I mean, that's it, you know, case closed. If I'm at the seafood place, well, I'm eating a piece of octopus on, in my stand-up. <laughs> so it's just... And, and that's the matter, so, you know, and the only big decision I have to make is, am I going to have my stand-up in the middle as a bridge, or am I going to have it as a close at the end? And that's, that's always the big call. Now, a lot of times they have us do, you guys know, are familiar with what they call a donut? I, it's, I think it's a New York one term, but basically it's so, I'll do my seven and eight, and sometimes they'll say, oh, well, we want you to do a noon report too, but we want you to have a donut, which is basically, it's, it's like a piece without a, without a close at the end. So I come on the air, Roger Clark is live at the ice cream shop, blah, 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 blah hit throw to my donut, so the, the, the piece plays basically without it ending, then I come back and wrap it up live. So, I don't know, they call it a donut in New York one, I don't know where that came from, does they call that anywhere else? <laughs> yeah, it's the weirdest thing, when I first heard it, I was like, what's a donut, you know? <laughs> I mean, I love donuts, of course, obviously, but. <laughs> you talk about how you like to have, you know, the egg cream and the sea urchin, so it's like. Right, it's a natural. So yeah, so when I do the donuts, so sometimes it's kind of weird because it's very convenient to just tag on an ending stand-up, like blah, 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 blah. If you want to find out more information, go to da, 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 Roger Clark, New York One. It's uh, kind of boring. I'd rather do something fun in the middle. And then what would I would do in that case is, believe it or not, my editor would cover my stand-up. I would track it also. So you wouldn't see my camera. He would cover it. And then later on, when the piece runs on its own throughout the day, then the stand-up gets plugged in. So it's weird. So it, well, the, one of the challenges is make sure you shoot enough video of whatever I'm going to be talking about in my stand-up. So they can cover it in the donut, <laughs> and then so, it's, it's a lot of little things, but yeah, so that's the, the ultimate goal, and it's like, in between seven and eight, the live segments in the morning, I'm already, I'm already shooting for the, for the package that's running, and we're 24 hours, so this thing is running all day, 
and then even overnight. So I can't date it too much. You know, I can't say today because it could be playing tomorrow. You know, have to keep it like usually, have, you know, which I learned very early on working in New York One. Like you can't say, well, you know, people were hanging out on yesterday. Well, you can't say yesterday because if it's running after midnight, then it's not yesterday <laughs> anymore. I know it sounds kind of crazy. So little things like that. That's just the challenge of working at a 24-hour station. If you work at Channel 2, Channel 4, and your piece is only running on the 11 o'clock news, well, that's a whole different story. Then you could say, you could date it, because then it's dead. It's after that. It's not running again. Our pieces run over and over and over and over, which is cool, because it gets a lot of play. And that's how I'm able to convince people to come in in the morning and do the segments with us, because they know that it's, go it's not going on one time. I mean, it's going to go play over, over. People, you know, half the time when we do stories with people, they're like, oh, my God, I've been getting texts all day. Yeah, because every hour the thing's playing. <laughs> so, and in the five boroughs, so it's good. So it's, that's hard to coax people to do, to, you know, hey, they're like, oh, God, I don't want to wake up. I've got to be there at 6.15 in the morning and let you guys in, and then I've got to talk on TV. I never wake up this early. But then I tell them, hey, but this is our most viewed period, 7 to 9. Everybody's watching. And then after that, you're going to get it all day. So that's how I coax them twist their arms to make them come in early and let us in and do live TV. So, so that's one of the things. Yeah. And what is the significance of having you out there on the scene? I mean, do they ever ask you that? Like, do you really have to do this story with me at this specific location? Like, can't you just talk? They, absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the big questions. Like, well, why don't you guys, well, they'll say, well, why don't you come when our store is busy? Because a lot of times, like, we'll go to a diner in the morning. And like today, when we went to that ice cream place, there was nobody there. There was like two people eating breakfast, you know. At, when we came back at noon, it was jammed. So a lot of people will say, oh, come later when it's busy. But the thing is that it's morning drive. Th that's when everybody's watching. And it, it's part of the show, you know. So we like, a lot of times we'll preview something that may be happening later in the day. And I do have to convince people a lot of times, like, oh, well, why do you want to come at, you know, 6.15? It's ridiculous. We're not even open, da 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 And I have to say, yeah, but this is, we're going to get you out there. And especially when it comes to a lot of nonprofits and things like that who can get a lot of bang for their buck, you know, and I do stories with nonprofits all the time, and, and, they, and, and not being cocky, but they always say, once we run, they, get, they start getting hits on, their, on, the, on the website. Like, you know, animal shelters, like cute little, I'm a carrot holding a cute little kitty, oh, please adopt this, forget about it. All of a sudden, people are running in there. So that's what I tell them. I tell them that there's a lot of power there. You know, it's, it's really cool, they, you know, and it's great, especially if it's a good, a good cause, people that are doing great stuff for the community. I love, that's another thing I do. I don't always just do that. <laughs> I actually like, I love like shining the light on, on organizations that do great stuff and help people. And I love it because it's great. And I'm the native New Yorker, so it's, I like to see people who are helping people in the city to make it a better place. And that's what it's all about. So I try and find those things too, you know, when I look for stories. And when I get pitches like that, I'm like, wow. I jump right on it because it's, that's what the city's all about, you know, that's what it's all, you know, people trying to, you know, look, we're all going through tough times, right? So if you get these groups that are helping people, it's good stuff, you know. People love it, you know, people really do. Mm -hmm. Any other yeah. Yes, sir. So far, I guess the most difficult thing you have to do in the business so far. I think still always, every time it's, every time it's funerals. Because I've had, a, that, you know, I, w I covered 9-11, sadly. In fact, I, was, I started two weeks before 9-11 at N New York One. I'd been working up in Poughkeepsie. And, you know, we had some, some rough stories up there, but pff, obviously nothing. I mean, I was covering funerals for, not to be a bummer, but for months. I mean, literally for months. My job was, my first job before I became the features part was the Staten Island car risk porter correspondent. And a lot of uh, firefighters and cops live on Staten Island. So... Literally, I was covering two a day for months. It never stopped. Not great. So even to this day, now when, obviously, you know, thank God, not when things have calmed down, but one person dead, you know, and, a lot, and that's always, and you guys will find that if you get into the business. There's nothing worse than having to go knock on the door of someone who lost somebody. But we have to do it. They make us do it. The bosses, you can't say no, because the other stations are doing it. And it stinks, and you may in your mind be like, I feel like a vulture. They don't want me. They don't want me here. What am I? What am I? What am I doing? Why am I bothering these people? They just lost. Uh, someone just died. But if that's the assignment, that's the assignment. And that is definitely one of the challenges. Is getting, like, I could do that every day, be a goofball, but to get the, you know, get psyched up to knock on that door or to walk up to these people at a crime scene when. 
they just got, someone was just murdered. That is always the toughest thing. Absolutely, you know, and, and every day. And like, if I know I'm covering a funeral, like if a firefighter dies or a cop dies, we're always going. You know, any civil, big civil servant. Yeah, it's always, that's, that, I definitely would say that's always the toughest. Yeah, by far. I mean, for me at least. Some people, some people, it's not, you know, it's weird. Some, some reporters are more into the harder stuff, and for them, it's not, they, it doesn't bother them. It doesn't phase them. You get a little, I guess, sensitized is the best word for it, right? Yeah. I, I can't. You know, I, I always feel like, and it really bothers me, because I've been at, at scenes with other reporters who I don't feel treated with the proper respect or treat people with the proper dignity at that moment. Like, they're too much right in the face, that microphone. Oh, come on, da, 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 da. why are you talking to us? Da, 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 da. I mean, come on, no, no. There's a way to do it. That I've learned over the years. You gotta be respectful. If you go, all right, listen, if I'm out here and I gotta talk to someone who's, whose kid just got shot, uh, there's, gotta, there's a better way than just sticking the mic in their face and be a jerk about it. You know, you have to handle it in a good way. Talk to them like, oh, you know, I'm really sorry for your loss. We're trying to do a nice tribute to your son, your daughter. Is it okay, can we just have a couple of words, please? Yeah, I'm really sorry, to, you know, I know this is a tough time, but it, and you know, Sometimes I say yes, sometimes I say words that I can't say on, since I'm being taped. Bad, bad things. I've had, I've been called some bad stuff. Bad stuff. I've been chased out of places, doors slammed in my face. But it, yeah. Yes, ma'am. No, most of the time, if something like that happens, they, they usually will respect that. You know, but they may still show up at the funeral. But I'll tell you, like, this is an interesting, st one time, a guy killed his mother and father on Staten Island. He was mentally ill. And they sent me to the church on the day of the funeral. So we, so it was Staten Island, very, it's suburban, obviously, so they, they had a big parking lot there, unlike, you know, a church like in Manhattan or Brooklyn, where you're not gonna have a parking lot. So we put, you know, put the truck in the parking lot, like, <laughs> you know, and at some point, people are starting to gather in front of the church, so I was like, all right, fine, well, we gotta do this, let's go. Me and my photographer walked over, Nobody wants to talk. And they're like, get the, you know, get the F out of here, like things like that. And f so we walk back, and then all of a sudden, somebody from the church said, you guys gotta get out. You guys are go you gotta get out of this parking lot. You can't come in here, you can't talk to people here. And I have to confess, I was a little relieved. <laughs> and I called the station, I was like, they are not letting us talk to these people. We cannot even get close to the church. I don't know how I'm gonna get any sound on this story. This is impossible. We can't get in the church. We're not even allowed on the grounds of the church. What are we gonna do, like stick our mic as the cars are pulling out? Get run over by, no. So they were like, okay, forget it. So that does happen. Like, they, it, it, they're relentless sometimes, but not that relentless, where at the point where if they ask that, you know, like I wasn't gonna like, you know, like, you know, <laughs> repel down the side of the church and see. Well, you know, it's funny you said that, because one time I actually got, it's funny, when I first started at New York One, I got in trouble. I got yelled at by one of Mayor Giuliani's men, and it was a total mistake. I didn't know we weren't allowed to shoot in the church. I was shooting by myself. I was a one-man band. They sent me to cover this firefighter's funeral. And they had a side door open in the church. So me being, I just started, eager beaver, right? I'm like, okay. Set up the tripod, put the camera on. This guy, one of Giuliani's guys, real big guy. What the hell are you doing? What? Do you know? Get out of here. Embarrass me in front of all these firefighters, cops, all these fans. It was really, it was worse. Learned my lesson. You know, I, I didn't, but it was, I was an innocent mistake, but at the same time, I kind of like looked like a dope because I wasn't following the rules that were set down. I didn't know. Even my assignment desk didn't tell me, no cameras. I was like, oh, I could shoot through a door, right? That's okay. Like, I, yeah, so it's, it, it's one of those things, you know? It's, it's one of those things. But yeah, I don't, I, I, they're not that bad. <laughs> like, they, if, if they say, they'll, they'll respect the wishes of the family. At least you hope so, right? You know, if they don't, then I'm, I don't know. Then I, I mean, I disagree with that. You know, personally. But, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes, sir? What was it like coming out of college? And um, well, I did my first eight years in radio, mainly, and I'm sure your professor is going to make sure this doesn't happen to you guys. My TV tape was terrible. First of all, my New York accent was, I mean, it was very nasally, and I was like, hey, how you doing? How you? I mean, it was just, it wasn't working. And I didn't take the time I mean, I'm sure you guys know, but stressing internships, you know, I, 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 I interned at MTV. It was a stupid mistake. I mean, it was fun, but it wasn't the right place. I should have been at one of the local Syracuse stations, so I went to Syracuse. Um, so my TV tape wasn't that great. My radio tape was all right. But it took me about, so I worked as a secretary 
at a media rep firm in Manhattan for about six months. And then out of nowhere, I'd sent like 8,000, like, <laughs> this is how old I am, cassette tapes, okay? <laughs> out to different stations, and a station in Oneonta, New York, about three and a half hours north, called me and said, we'd like you to come in for an interview. I was like, Oneonta? And all I knew about Oneonta is that some kids from my neighborhood in Queens went to school there still. Now, I graduated college, but it was a couple, so I called them, I'm like, hey, dude, can I crash on your couch? I got an interview at the radio station. <laughs> and they're like, the school radio station? I'm like, no, there's actually a radio station in your town that's a real radio station, just so you know. Like, <laughs> they had no idea. They didn't listen to the, you know, they it was like, and uh, yeah, I got the job. And like, totally, and picked up, and I moved to Oneonta, New York, from straight out of Queens. Had no, I was homesick, lonely, but I, I could have been in Idaho, right? I could have been in South Dakota. At least I was in striking distance. If I wanted to hop on a Greyhound, I could still get back home and see family and friends. So I, in a way, I was fortunate that way. I mean, I couldn't do it all the time because I was broke. My, f when I, my first salary was $13,000 a year in radio. <laughs> now, that was, that was 1990, okay? So that was a long time ago. It's probably a little bit better. Also, they probably have no newsroom anymore because radio news is, has gone down the tube, sadly. Like, we had a pretty, we, I was the news director, and I had two stringers who went out and covered stuff. I had a guy who came in in the afternoons. I mean, it was actually, we covered stuff. Went to city council meetings, town hall meetings, county meetings. The county board w in where that was in Cooperstown, where the baseball hall of fame is, which was pretty hilarious, because I never even realized, you know, I just think, oh, well, that's where the hall of fame is. You don't realize that they actually have official business there. Just, that's where their courts were. Was, everything was in Cooperstown, so. I covered a murder trial once, and for lunch, I went to the batting cage. <laughs> I was so bored. I was like, I gotta, I gotta get some uh, energy out. Yeah, so that was my first murder trial, and I was like, I had no, and, and I was like sitting about like from me to you the, was the guy who was, uh, was uh, yeah, because it was such a small courthouse, and I was kind of creeped out by that. He kept looking at me the whole time, and I was like, don't look at me in the murder. <laughs> and he was, he actually got convicted. It was, it was pretty crazy, but yeah, but um, yeah. So at a college, so that's what I did. So it took a while for me. I think things are a little bit different now. I think if you do the right internships and you get your foot through the door more, I mean, I, I, I definitely wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I did it the right way. It took me a while. Like, so basically, it took me 10 years to get back to New York City, which was always my goal, was to work in my hometown. So 10 years, but so eight years in radio, two years at a very small TV station in Wappingers Falls, New York. You ever heard of Wappingers Falls, anybody? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. It was lovely, yeah, near Poughkeepsie. It was great, I loved it up there. I actually really liked living in the Hudson Valley. It was beautiful. But I always knew in my head, like I would, we got this, the New York stations, and I would be like, I need, to be, I need to be on TV in New York City. Like, this is my, I mean, this, you know, I gotta, I gotta go home, you know? But it took 10 years, but it finally happened, you know, thank God, you know? I, you know I, but uh, it, was a, it was a road, you know, it was a road. I worked there, I worked in, well, actually worked at WFAS in White Plains. I worked in Poughkeepsie. I worked in Newburgh, New York. And I bopped around for about 10 years, then I got the TV gig. And then finally, a woman who had worked at my station before me had a job in New York One. And she called and said, there's a <coughs> position available, bless you, uh, for a Staten Island reporter position. And some, by chance, I grew up, part of my growing up was in Staten Island. And she goes, send the tape now. Send a tape now. <laughs> and I didn't even have, see, another thing, a resume reel ready to go. I literally took like some cheap VHS cassette tape like, that I probably had a movie on put a couple of my pieces on it, and I just sent it. It was terrible, it probably, somehow I got the job. I have no idea, and I think, really, I think the only reason I got the job is because they gave me a quiz about Staten Island and I got nine out of 10 right. I don't even think I had anything to do with my tape. <laughs> I think they just wanted somebody who knew where, like, where the, what bridges were in Staten Island and what the names of the high schools were, which is pretty hilarious. So I was just a lucky, I think that was like a lucky break. The tape probably, my tape was terrible. I mean, it was just like it was the one, you know, you know so, you guys, I'm sure you guys are ready for that. You guys got your tapes and, you know, not even tapes anymore. You got the links ready to go. And that's definitely a good recommendation. Just have that ready to go. You never know. You never know. Like, someone may be like, hey, what can you do? Bing, here it is. You know? Definitely have it ready, ready to go at all times. Because I did it. I did it that time. And I got lucky. I mean, I could have got screwed over just because I wasn't prepared. But I guess I had, like, I'd, you know, you become very complacent sometimes in, in, this, in this business. Like, and then you start thinking, oh God, I'm never gonna go. I'm never gonna get to New York. I'm never gonna get to a big market. Oh, this, I'm, I'm gonna be trapped here for the rest of my life. This, you know. And then you still then so that that brings you to the point where you don't have a tape ready to go or you know or, or resume reel ready to go, and that you can't let let that happen. You got to always be ready to know at any time something could break for you. You know, or you keep 
pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. You know, that was a fortunate break for me to get that gig. You know, but what if it never happened? You know, actually, that sta the station I worked at went out a year later, down. So I got the timing couldn't have been better. Thank God. So it was like you just never know. You know, you never know. <laughs> Definitely, I always, uh, in fact, I was just telling my photographer today, we, we shot a stand-up for her out in the field, which is one of the services we provided here. <laughs> if you're a photographer, a lot of times, if the, if the reporter's nice, we'll shoot a stand-up for you for your reel. And I told her, I thought she did a good job, but I told her the best thing, you guys, are, I'm sure you've stressed, conversational. You know, nobody wants to hear a robot, and I know you still hear them on TV sometimes, but if you think about it, a lot of the people you like the best are the ones who talk to you like, like, I'm, I'm talking to you now, or like you would talk to your friend. You know, just, be, you'll be natural in conversation. Don't get stuck into that, into the, ha you know, that, like, the, that mold of like, hi, I am Roger Clark, here I am at the scene of this fire, there are two firefighters who are injured, da, 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 like a robot. No, you know. And there's a time to be straight when it's a serious story, but you could still do it in a way where you're being human. And that's really the thing. You just don't get caught in the trap of trying to be so, you know, of, of being too, and yeah, because I watch even people, and oh look, their network correspondents are making a lot more money than me. They have a better job. But I look at them and I'm like, ah, this guy's not, I'm not listening to this guy. He's, he's, he's just talking past me. I want to be spoken to. You know, speak to me. Talk, you know, speak in, in terms and words that I can understand. Don't use, you know. And that's, that's what, what I always look for, you know. I, I, and, and that's what I recommend to people. Now, I don't know. I may never work at a network because maybe I'm too conversational. I don't know. Maybe my style is a little too lax. I don't know. That's kind of what the, but that's what I appreciate. So, I mean, you know what I mean? It's, is that crazy or? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Do you ever get nervous? I do. I do. You know, I try not to, I try and, because I'm going live every day two times, right? I, or maybe three and maybe four. So, and then if it's a big story, like one day I was doing this a couple of months ago, I was doing a story at a Bialy store that had reopened on the Lower East Side. You know what Bialy's are? They're like almost like, like Bagel's evil twin. So like <laughs> but this place had been around for ages. They shut down, re renovated, and then they reopened. Fun story. I'm eating Bialy's on TV. I'm eating bagels. I'm laughing. Haha. And then like about a mile away, a crane collapses in downtown Manhattan. Like, you remember that? Yeah. So they're like, Roger, go, go. So I'm in the car driving, and you know it's snowing, it's cold, and I start getting, a, you start getting the butterflies a little bit. You're like, all right, how am I going to tackle this? Where are we parking? <laughs> parking is a big thing in New York City. Like, how, where am I going to put this car? Where's the truck going to go? How are we, is, is the, the equipment going to work? There's cops everywhere. Where do we go? How are we going to get through? That, that makes me more nervous. If I'm doing a light feature story, I don't get as nervous. When that stuff happens, that's when I start. But you know, you just have to like fight through it, you know, because you got the job to do. Because uh, I mean, literally, they're calling. They called me as I'm driving. You're like, we need a phoner. We need some kind of presence there. Get on the phone. I'm like, I'm not even there yet. I'm three blocks away. I don't even see the. Cr I can't see the crane. We don't care. Go, go. So I'm talking. Yeah, there's a lot of. Like I stopped the car. I pulled it over. And it's like on a hydrant, and I'm like. Yeah, oh my God, there's all kinds of people around here. Uh, yeah, the traffic snarled. And I, mean, I can't even see the crane. <laughs> I can't see the crane yet. So that's, but, but that happened. That's what they could do to you. I mean, that's, that's the, when you're news, local news, I mean, they want it right away. Boom. But, yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. And, uh, and then I actually said to my anchor at one point, he's like, Roger, are you going to try and get closer versus now? Are you going to stay on? And I said, and I, I finally was like, no. I'm not staying on the phone. I'm going to find the crane. I will talk to you later. <laughs> and I hung up the phone, like, on the air, because it was ridiculous. There was no, you know, I, I wanted to get closer, but th it was like the battle between me getting to this actual scene and figuring out where I could actually see things and them wanting the content immediately. Could you just move it somewhere else? I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I was looking at a different building, and I thought that was the one where the crane fell from, and I was wrong. So I don't, I don't like to, like, and you hear it all the time, like, you don't ever like to, like, say something. I, 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 I want to just stick to what I know. 
And I tell them if they, and a lot of times the anchors will throw a question at you. And I was like, I, what are you asking me for? The day of the Belgium bombing, I was on the air. They sent me to JFK. And for to see what, if security had been ramped up, people were, flights were canceled. <coughs> and as I was closing out, the li uh, my anchor said, and innocently, no big deal, said, Roger, do you know of, uh, any, was there any credible, th are there any credible threats against New York? Now, I'm killing time. We're about to go to a live press conference with the police commissioner and the mayor, who probably know more about that than me, right? The police commissioner, I have no idea if there's a credible threat against New York City. Absolutely none. I just came from, a, from, sh from City Field where they were practicing singing the national anthem like in American Idol's contest. They made me get into a cab. They sent a truck somewhere else, made me get into an Uber and drive to JFK and meet up with another photographer. I get there, they throw me in front of the camera, and yeah, well, yeah, it does look like there's tons of security around here. Uh, yeah, I t we talked to a couple of people, they weren't on flights from, oh yeah. yeah. But then when they ask me a question like that, I mean, I, that's when I have to like put my foot down. And I'm not saying, yeah, probably. There probably is no credible threat. I don't know, so I'm not saying anything. I'm like, so I'll tell them, I'm, be, I'm honest. I'm like, hey, there, I, don't, I, I really don't know. I'm sure that the mayor and the police commissioner will have more about this. Boom, cover my bases, right? Sound okay, half and way intelligent, and I'm not lying or I'm reporting false information. So that's, so you get caught in that situation sometimes. And it's, it's a little weird, you know, because you don't know what they're gonna come back, come, that you don't know what they're coming at you with, sometimes the anchors, when they ad lib. You were talking about ad libbing before. Sometimes they have to, they call it a tap dance. They're waiting for a press conference to start and they just need to kill time. So they keep talking and they'll keep coming back to you. I mean, and you're talking about, it could be anything, you know? But my thing is always like, I'm just gonna describe the scene, talk about what I know, and not make any kind of suggestions of anything else that I don't know. That's how I keep it, you just keep it like that. Because I don't want to be that guy, you know today, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I don't want to be that guy who said, yeah, there's definitely a credible threat against the New York City, when there's not. Then I look like a sh well, schmuck, a idiot. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. It's interesting though. <laughs> you get the, that, that makes me nervous too, being put in that situation. Because you're like, eh, ooh. <laughs> and then it's like slow motion. It's like one second, it turns into like 100 seconds. You're like, what do I say? How do I not sound stupid here? You could do it, Roger. <laughs> like, <laughs> and that's it. How often would you say hmm? you're Yeah, most of my mornings are planned. We have, in the our, we have two, two morning sh uh, reporters. One is they call breaking news. They actually get in a half hour early, and they do murders, fires, bad stuff. Then I do like more of the featurey, more light stuff. But yeah, that being said, cranes collapse, bombs go off. Uh, I, and, and yeah, it's weird. One day, oh yeah, another example. So one day I was doing a story. It was a cool story. There was a guy who was actually a comic book artist. For, uh, he'd worked for Marvel. He's working for DC. He was teaching kids how to draw comics. Really cool. We walk in there. He brought some of his comics. Like he had Batman and Spider-Man. And my truck operator is a huge comic book fan. We're like in heaven. We're like, this is the best. He had some Star Wars things. Like this guy's awesome. We did the first segment. Five seconds later, a woman was, again, not to be a bummer, old lady shot in the face in Jamaica, Queens. Gang-related thing. Go, go. We were in Forest Hills, 15 minutes. Go. So here we are, go from comic book to a horrible, brutal murder. And within like five minutes, like it just like all of a sudden things change. So you have to all of a sudden change your demeanor, you know, you know, and, 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 and get into like, you just lay into a different mode. You know, you're like, okay, well, it's not comic books anymore. Now I, I gotta like, you know, and then you get there and you got to find the people and talk to who, who was the family, who knew this guy, who, lady, you know, and, and that's it. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, I, I'm not, I wish I had a percentage of how many times this happens, but it, it, it is, I mean, most of the time we get through the morning doing my story, the story that we have planned, but it comes up 
probably once a month, maybe. Maybe once a month that we're, and then there's some days where they just have, it's like, I'll, they'll have me cover, um, like, well, election season coming up. I know for sure I will be at a polling site on the day of the New York primary. Yeah, so there'll be no fooling around that day. That's for sure. And then probably the next day, I will get reaction to the New York primary. <laughs> so those things are in your head. There's certain, like, they call them, like, I guess you call them go for sure. It's like St. Patrick's Day Parade, Columbus Day Parade. It's like Groundhog Day. Yeah. St. Patrick's Day is tough when the drunks come out <laughs> and they start trying to get behind your shot. <laughs> what do you do when that happens? You just have to like, you know, just like roll with it. You know, this year we were lucky. They gave us a better spot and only the parade was behind me and there was no chance of any people coming, so it was good. So there was, it, but you just have to roll with it. You know, you just do the best you can and you hope that it's not. I, I remember one time I had a lady... This was in Brooklyn. Oh my God, this late. She was kind of, I think, I'm pretty sure she was like a little stone, drunk, combination of both, something. She actually had a beer can in her hand. But, <laughs> but she was just like, she like bumped into me as I was live and she's like, ah, you know. And I was on the air and, I, and the, I, she said, Oh, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to spoil your day. And I said, Oh, it's okay. Story of my life. You know, like I just had like had some fun with it. You know, just. Rather than being like, hey, you jerk, you know, like, because nobody wants to see me like that. See, that's the thing. I'm not changing, you know, I've seen, you've, you guys have seen that, and that's a fatal mistake. I've seen reporters who are on the air have that happen, are like, hey, fuck, you know, right? That, nobody wants to see that. It's great to go to viral, and you're going to look like a total jerk. It's a challenge. It's scary. Like, the, that's your reaction is like, come on, man, you're ruining my live shot here. What? Stop it. You really you have to, you're not going to get on TV. You know, the camera's not on. <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but I can't act like that on TV because then everybody's gonna be like, Roger Clark's an asshole. Right? I mean, you know, but I mean, I don't know. Is it ever gonna happen to me? Am I ever gonna drop the F bomb? Am I gonna be a total jerk? I don't know. I hope not. It's scary. That's another thing I get nervous about. That's like a life changer. You know, you don't wanna do that. Especially with this day of social media. Boom, it's out there. You know? You know? If I. But look, here we have some defense systems, though. I have a very big truck operator, two of them, Greg in one truck and Dave in another truck, the large men. They, they're there for me. If they see someone coming down the street who they think looks, they'll help me out. That's helpful. But it's an issue. I mean, it's definitely an issue. And people want to, you know, I've even had the guy from the Howard Stern show, the Baba Booey. You guys remember? There used to be a thing where Howard Stern, the DJ, used to tell people to go and ruin people's live shots and say, Baba Booey! And I've had a lot of Baba Booey's over the past <laughs> 15 years, you know? You know but, but they've actually like ran right up to someone, on, like a reporter, go, bah! and scared the hell out of them. You know, you gotta look out for stuff like that. You know, it's, it, people, you know, everybody wants to like make their mark in some way. And a, the, that one, a good way is to screw with a TV reporter, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, it's instant fame. You know, it kind of stinks, but story of our life. <laughs> Have you ever uh, thought of doing something that would put you behind the anchor chair? I mean, do you, do you ever sit behind it? I do. I fill in occasionally. I fill in, yeah, from time to time on the weekends. They probably would never put me there on a weekday, <laughs> unless it was a holiday. But um, I do get a kick out of it. It's fun. When I was in Poughkeepsie, I anchored, that I was an anchor and news director. It was crazy. I actually, so I would get in in the morning. I had small station. So I ran the meeting with my reporters. I had three reporters, a sports guy, and a weather guy. Came in, gave everybody their assignments for the day, sat at a table, they went out. I went into the computer, started setting up like the grid, what the show would look like with the blocks. All right, I'm gonna put this story as a top story for now unless something changes and they're gonna do this. And then, yeah, you know, and, and I'd start writing other stories. I was doing everything. I mean, literally everything. And then at 5.30, I put, uh, 5.15, put makeup on and then go and uh, anchor the newscast. And it was fun. But at New York One, I got the job as a reporter, which, believe it or not, I didn't do that all that much reporting. I had done a lot of radio reporting, but the TV stuff, I, I usually was behind the desk. So when I got to New York One, in my head, I thought maybe they were hiring me because they thought I would be an anchor at some point. But that was not the case. I'm still out on the street. I do fill in from time to time, and it's a kick, you know, reading off the teleprompter, looking all like snazzy and the makeup and everything. It's fun, but I don't know. Being on the street is cool. I get to meet a lot of, like, cool people and see different things, learn stuff. Like it's almost like having a master's in everything. 
Like every day, like I literally like, someone will tell me something every day and I'll be like, what? Are you kidding me? No idea. Little things, like, and it's fun. And that's like, I go home and I tell my wife, I'm like, did you know? Da -da 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 -da. You know, so that's one of the cool things. Now behind the anchor desk, you're kind of just like reading up the teleprompter. You know, I mean, you're definitely more famous. You get more, you know, but there's something cool about being out beyond the street. Now, if they said, Roger, you want to take over the morning show and be the anchor? Oh, yeah. Hell yeah, I'm doing it. But until they do that, which probably is never, <laughs> I'm, I'm good, you know, you know. Yeah, you know, every day. <laughs> and I think it's because you probably notice, I, I, like, I'm very, I come across very accessible. Some people, I think there's certain celebrities and, and to lower, lesser extent, like news people, that people won't approach because they just don't have that, you know, they come across and more. For some reason, I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but <laughs> that people think they, they know me. And that's a good thing, I think, I, I, and that, for me, I appreciate that. So, like, the other day, I'm on the subway, and the person across from me like, Roger, Roger from New York One, how you doing? <laughs> Whole train now looking at me, like, hey. And then the lady next to him, oh, oh my God, oh. So now I get to my stop, and he's like, I want to take a picture with you. Don't go. It's like, I, I, I got to, the doors are closing. And, you know, I felt bad that I didn't take a picture, but I realized I, was, I couldn't stay on the train. I would have been 100, it was 96th Street. I would have been 125th, next stop, which is like about eight stops from my house. So, like, I was like, well. So I felt, I, me, I, I'm very guilty. Like, I always feel like I have to talk to everybody. Like, even if they're crazy. <laughs> even my, my people who work with me are like, why don't you talk to that person? They're nuts. And I'm like, because that's what I do. Like, I want to talk to everybody. It's good, you know, I don't want to, you know, and I, I hate, one time I had a situation where, and it made me really upset, but it, you guys, you judge for yourselves. I'm walking to Central Park, I'm on Fifth Avenue and 97th Street. I'm with my five-year-old son, he's on a scooter. A woman grabs my arm, Roger! My son is riding the scooter into Fifth Avenue. I ran to get him and kept walking. She puts on Facebook, Roger Clark's a jerk, I tried to talk to him and he, he dissed me. I wrote, so I, I messaged her. I'm like, my son was about to get hit by a bus. I really, at this moment, and, like, and I, never, I would never not say hello to someone or stop, but come on, you guys, what do you guys think? If your son is about to get hit by a bus on a scooter? Like, and plus also, there is a little bit of a line, like if you're with your kid, people really don't follow the, the rules. I mean, a lot of times I'm talking to people and my poor son is standing there. It's like, daddy, who is that? I don't know. <laughs> Daddy, who's that? I don't know. But, you know, it, but it's a blessing. Uh, to me, it means, like, the people responding to what I'm saying. You know, it's good. So, yeah, it's great. And New York One is kind of like a cult. The people watch New York One, it's like, almost like a cult. Uh, it, 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 they love our morning anchor, Pat Kiernan, like he's like a god. <laughs> and then all of us, the reporters who get on the air, like, people, like, consider us almost like part of the family. Because we're so local. You know, so, so local. And like, look at me. I mean, am I, do I look like a reporter? Probably not, right? I mean, I don't have like that glossy kind of look. I mean, I'm like, just like a regular guy. And I think that's what happens. And I think that's why I get stopped more. I think that's it. P even people, my photographers are like, two, three people in the morning, like walking up to me. They're like, wow. And I'm like, yeah, this happens every day. People, people are nice. And it's a good thing, like I said. Now, if they're coming up to me and saying, you suck, I'll take that even, because they're watching, right? <laughs> They're watching. <laughs> that's what we want. <laughs> if they think I suck, that's good. They're watching. So I was always saying that too many people saying you suck. If I get 10, 15 people a day saying I suck, that's not good. But <laughs> then it starts to be my self self esteem starts going down a little bit. Like, oh boy, do I really suck that much? <laughs> hey. hey. Um, I know you said you went to grad school for yeah, I went to the broadcast journalism, which is now broadcast journalism and uh, electronic media or whatever. Um, they changed it because obviously because now, like a big part of the job is the social media aspect of it as well. And yeah, and that's got you guys will learn that too. You probably know already. It's from, right. You tweet half the time. I mean, it wasn't like that when I started. Now all I'm doing is tweeting. I want to tell people what I'm doing, you know. But yeah, so I did. I studied broadcast journalism and. Basically, I got lucky. I'm doing what I, I studied. I wanted to, you know. Did you feel it was necessary after college? Did you get it glasses for you? Uh, oh, no, I did it. Yeah, I did it. I didn't do I never went to graduate school. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
That was my um, my bachelor. I sent um, I sent fifty bucks to Columbia for their journalism school to go to the masters, and I got a, and then I never did it. I got the job in Oneonta, and I just said, and I never turned back. I never got my masters. I just that I didn't think I needed, yeah. and I, I don't want to discourage anybody from getting ma your masters. But I, at that point, I already was learning. I was on the street every day doing reporting. I didn't think I would go. I should go back to. I wasn't going to go back to school at, at that point, you know. So Columbia got my fifty bucks, which is now probably worth what, eight hundred dollars. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Do your students now need a master's degree to move back home? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we have a lot of master's people at um, at New York One. A lot of people came. And could, well, our managing editor who retired last year was a professor at Columbia at the Journalism Master's Program. And another one of our guys who hosts our, our nighttime call-in program, he also works at the CUNY School of Journalism Master's Program. So we got a lot of people coming from there. And I mean, I can't hurt, but I don't know. There's not the, I mean, I don't know. I don't think it's, if you can get in, into the business and start doing it, I think you're, like, you're getting a master's anyway. If you, you know, and you guys are probably getting great training here, great training anyway. Like, I don't know what else, you'd, what else you would do after going through this, right? I mean, this is great. You're doing stories already. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, I, mean, I don't know. I feel like the, your best bet is just, like, is, is hit the ground running. Like, start getting it. <coughs> and we have a couple of, like, photographers at this stage. They're called video journalists, but um, who are, are still in school getting their, in their bachelor's program. And they're ready to, they're ready to, they're ready to go. Like, they want to get a reel. And they want to get a job somewhere. They're not, they're not thinking about going, going to school. They want to be in a newsroom working. And I, I think that's, I don't know. But I don't want to discourage you. I feel bad. I don't want to, I mean, the education's great. But, you know. Oh, no. Really? OK, good. Thank God. I don't feel like that. Oh, wow. OK. Huge, yeah, time. yeah. And she was like, while you're in an internship, if they like you and you do well there, they're going to hire you. We hire so many interns right after the pro It's um, I can't, I've never seen it. I'm so jealous because the New York one didn't exist when I got out of college, or else I probably would have did the same thing. There was no New York. They had, ju they had just started. They're about 25 years old. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these kids are go they're staying there. I can't believe it. And it's funny because they'll, I'll work with them for the first, like, uh, you know, I'll be training them. And I'll be like, hey, how's it going? I'm Roger. Yeah. She goes, she goes, oh, yeah, uh, I know who you are because I, I was an intern here last fall. And it, when I work in the mornings, I'm always out in the field, so I don't meet any interns, and I don't have an intern, and they never give us one. So, But, yeah, it, you're, I, I don't know. Good. I feel better now that I said that. And you guys, some other people said it, too. <laughs> I don't feel so bad about it now. Well, yeah, I always say that my, the, the, there's two people who have, had, who have my job. My dream job, Jeannie Moose at CNN, who does the funny, I love her stuff. And my, probably my idol is Bill Geist at CBS, morning, uh, CBS Sunday Morning Show, who actually, we just won an Emmy back uh, a couple weeks ago for, um, which actually I have a piece if you guys want to see it. And Bill Geist was being honored. I don't know if you guys ever watch the CBS Sunday Morning News. He does, and they showed a retrospective of his stuff. I mean, this guy does the best stuff. He actually like, did like a bikini car wash. He like he like rides donkeys, donkey basketball in the Midwest. Like he goes all over the country to find the weirdest, craziest things. And uh, his son is Willie Geist, who's on the Today Show now. If you guys ever watched the Today Show, but he was I love I was like oh my god I want this guy's job, I want his job. <laughs> so if they ever call me, I'll take it. I'll go. I'm on my way. You know. Can you yeah, you want your, yeah. Uh, you might get a kick out of this. So my boss has actually convinced us. We convinced my boss to let us, so you know how I told you our pieces are two minutes? Convince him to do a seven minute piece and the whole series is about how everything works in the city, water, sanitation, and we got great access to go like inside like weird places and tunnels like that. This one is actually about what happens to like your cans and bottles when you get rid of it. I know you're like, oh God, that sounds really boring, but it's actually really cool, <laughs> like cool than I expected. So if you want to check it out, and this actually, Won a New York Emmy Award, this, this piece, which is crazy.
Best photographer I ever worked with, too. He, doesn't, he, he left. He works for CNN now. He travels all over the world. He was just in Cuba. Shot this. Amazing. Sick. Which is probably why we got the Emmy, because of his shooting. Hmm? Cuba? Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, that's so cool. You're probably sorry. If you heard a guy with an Italian, thick Italian accent screaming at everybody, it was him. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I picked him right out. <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff going on. Like, oh, my God. Yeah. We sat out in the rain for like four hours waiting for Obama to drive by. What an experience. Oh, my God. Oof. That's so cool. It was awesome. One of these days I'll get there. It's, it's going to be the next vacation spot for America, I believe. Now the closest I get is a... Place that has Cuban sandwiches in the uh, Bay Ridge. No, I'm kidding. Oh, no, I'm joking. Nah, it's probably our link. Oh, you know what? It's coming up with the video. Yeah, they're, they're, you're allowed to have ten videos. It's so weird. Beep 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 beep. Uh, refresh it. Let's see. Oh, I know. That thing's coming down. You have to hit yes. Yeah, I think that when the link comes down, because you're only allowed to, they only let you use to watch 10 videos for free or else you have to be a member. So it's, like, it's annoying. So I think when it comes down, you have to press yes. So hit, yeah, I think, yeah, hit I think if you hit play again, it's going to come down. And w w yeah, you'll see it drop down. All right, so watch video. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. A lot of that sound, right? Yeah. Editor's great. Giant magnet? Yeah. <laughs> non magnetic items continue on. A special machine filters out plastic bags. Other plastics and aluminum keep going. Next, machines eject plastic by resin type. Ever notice those numbers at the bottom of your bottle? That's a resin code. There are hundreds of resins out there, but to keep things simple, the plastics industry created identification groups. They go from one to seven. Types 1 and 2 are the biggies for recyclers. Number 1 is polyethylene terephthalic. Speaking of pronouncing things. <laughs> That's your water and soda bottle. Number 2 is a thicker kind of plastic called high-density polyethylene, or HDPE. Your more rigid milk jugs and laundry detergent containers. 
Since each plastic type must be recycled separately, Tim uses optical sorters to distinguish what what. As items pass through, the sorter takes a picture using infrared light and determines the chemical composition of the resin. It's identifying the plastic, you can program this for whatever you want. In this case, we're programming it for number one PET plastic. It is looking for that. on to the next order, which targets another resin type, and so on through the system. For the HDPE number two plastic, things get sorted even further into clear and colored batches. Last but not least, one final machine detects and ejects aluminum. And while most of the process is automated, workers sift out the odd misplaced items. By the end of the line, we have massive bins, each filled with distinct material. They're empty moved to a baler, compressed, and taken to a storage area. This bale of aluminum weighs 2,000 pounds. It's just one of the end products of this sorting process, and they are products. They're commodities, and there's a market for these valuable materials. They will be sold and have a new life. Metals can be smelted and used once again. Glass can become a bottle or gravel for civil construction. The inside lining of some drink cartons can be put to an even more personal use. So there's a possibility the next time I use toilet paper that it was a milk carton in a bad place. Get out. <laughs> no way. I didn't know that. Tim sells mm -hmm. these commodities to customers all over the country. We checked out what's next for those milk jugs. It's road trip time for our crew. We're headed to the Graham Packaging Company Recycling Center in New York, Pennsylvania, about three hours from New York City. Inside, the jugs arrive from New York. They're broken down and get one more quick manual screen in case Tim's missed something. Next, the bottles are ground into flakes and sent into a float sink tank. HDPE plastics rise to the top. Contaminants like paper labels sink. The flakes are skimmed off, melted into a molten mass, then cut into uniform pellets. The pellets are dried and dropped into bottles. Graham doesn't just make pellets. They also have manufacturing plants around the world. We visited one just across the street where these pellets will be used to make bottles. We make roughly about 500,000 bottles a day, bottles that have that post-consumer recyclable, uh, roughly about 15 million bottles a month at this plant. Each new bottle consists of... It's one of the coolest things I ever saw. <laughs> it was like crazy. So you take those milk jug pellets, blend them with brand new or virgin pellets, throw some color in, and heat it all up to form a molten tube of plastic, which then heads into a machine that actually forms the bottle. The molds close onto it, and then there's various pins and needles that blow air into it, so it expands the bottle, and then it does a revolution across to form the bottle, and then it drops it down on our conveyor here. You probably recognize this bottle by its color and labeling. Those labels get checked for alignment. The bottles tested for leaks, that's a winding trip through the facility. Love that shot. And shipped out to clients so they can be filmed and capped. In about two weeks from this point, these detergent bottles will be sitting on your supermarket shelves. So there you have it, from your bin to a bottle. The biggest challenge in all of this is getting New Yorkers to recycle in the first place. To make things easier, in April 2013, the city greatly expanded the items we can toss in the bin, adding things like deli and yogurt containers, and there's more than just the environmental benefit. The more we recycle, the better it is for the city's bottom line. It's cheaper to pay Sims to take our recyclables than to pay for space in a landfill. So that's what happens to the items you put in the recycling bin. Hook shot. Yes. And that's how New York City works. Roger Clark, New York One. So that was it. That was a pretty good video though, right? He got like down and dirty. Like he went. Oh my God, that was. Well, we went to Pennsylvania one day. We went to the Sims place another day. We went to the Bron with the sanitation department out with them another day, where they took us out on the route with those the gar trash guys. Oh wow, another day. I just had to go. We found a laundromat to do the final shot. So yeah, I mean, we. Oh, it was like, it was a good like five six days of shooting, and and not to mention then putting the script together. Yeah, so these pieces, they're a challenge, you know, we, and, and we, 
It, it, but you know what? It, it definitely was worth it, the response. Like I've had teachers walk up to me and said, I I showed that to my, uh, I'm going to show this to my students in their class to teach them about recycling. And we did one for Con Edison about electricity, and they're actually showing it to their employees. So we were pretty proud. It was good. So that's, that's when like, the job is really cool. When you, you know, this was, I mean, this was just crazy. I mean, it was, it was a lot of, but the water system was good too. It was fun to take, a, we actually started uh, up in the Catskills and watched it. And we followed the water all the way down to like my faucet in my apartment. <laughs> like so, and it's just like we kind of followed the bottles here. Like we followed them from when, you know, you pick them up. And I couldn't believe it that they, you know, but it's, it's so that, yeah, well you, you know, you don't always get, these long form pieces are fun. I had always done short, you know, like radio, 30 seconds, you know, 45 seconds. TV, two minutes tops, right? Doing this and sitting down at my computer when we had all, shot all this, and I'm like, oh my God, I have to write this now? <laughs> like, I was like, and then I would write it and my producer would be like, this is wrong, this is, oh, no, that's terrible. Oh, oh come on. I mean, that back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you know. It's, it was crazy. It was crazy. But it was in the end, but when you watch it, you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> like, you know, so it's, that's what makes it all worthwhile, you know. We were, we were trying to, we didn't have a huge deadline. That's the best part. Because the thing is that I, was, I, I did this and my job at the same time. So I still had to be on the air. They took me off the air a couple of days. But still, I was like, going doing my shift, coming back, and then getting to it. And then... The editors, my editor and my photographer, they, everybody was doing their own jobs. Like my producer was also the head of lead assignment desk editor, assignment editor. So she's like, you know, calls coming in and everything, and then she's trying to schedule, like find a place for us to go and see <laughs> bottles get made. So it was, it was tough, and I think our bosses realized that, so they didn't give us. We tried to get everything on the air within two weeks, two, three weeks. So they wanted us to do once a month, and it just it was impossible, because just we were all doing our, if, it was, if that was our only job, we could have definitely done it, but when you're doing your other job too, <laughs> you guys know, when you're doing, you know, juggling, it, it's really hard, especially when, like, you know, going to York, Pennsylvania, I mean, I, that takes a whole day back and forth, I mean, so, but it was definitely, it was definitely worth it, it was fun, it was fun, you know, it was, it was, it was good, and working with this guy, the guy who shot it, you could probably tell, and also the editor, he was a very talented editor, you could see how he used all the Nat sounds, he brought it up in places that I never would have did. And, and places that like, in our, you know, I have to confess, in our two minute pieces that we do, sometimes it's such a rush to get them on. Not that they're not good, but you may not make them as fancy, but when you have the time to do something like this, and really, like we went one day to the, to the plant, right? And then my photographer went back by himself and he shot everything, close up, this, that. Because while I was, we were walking around getting the tour, he really, they were kind of rushing us through, and he really couldn't really stop and like smell the roses, as I say, and get it. So he went back, and he really, so, so he was there two days, you know. And some of these places, like, like this, like we also did wastewater treatment, <laughs> which I'm sure you guys would be thrilled about. I'm sure you sh you're glad I didn't show you that one. You know, what happens when you, you know, flush the toilet? Yeah. <laughs> um, where does it go? And we, it, where it goes really smells bad. <laughs> like really bad and we were there a couple of days at this like sewage plant you know shooting you know sewage and oh my god it was hilarious it was you know all of us are like jesus christ we got to get out of here this is terrible but but in the end it, people were like oh that's really cool i always wanted to know what happened after i you know what and where does it go what happens to it you know and it gets treated and sent into the east river which is crazy yeah i know i know it's crazy it's nuts right i couldn't believe it either but that also a good part about the job, learning. Like, I didn't know about half this stuff. I didn't, I, and also, this is crazy. I know you, and you, you'll find this as a, when you get in the business too, when you start doing stories and you learn about people and things, it affects you personally. I am such a better recycler after doing this than I was before. I didn't know about the Chinese food containers and about the deli containers. I, I was throwing that stuff away. Yeah, everything is so much. I know, it's crazy. I'm like a nut now about like, when we order out takeout and stuff like that, now I'm like cleaning out the container and I'm putting it in a bag and I'm recycling it. I never would have did that five years ago. I would have been like, ah, screw it, throw it. Even bottles, now bottles and cans, I, I, I'm like a nut. Mainly because I did this and I saw like what happens. Like this guy, you know, who was the head of the plant, he's like an expert and he's like, yeah, the landfills are ridiculous and it's bad. Like we need to cut down on this. And why, 
And he's like, why would you want to throw something in the garbage when it can get reused again? And he's like, it's like, yeah, that's a really good point, <laughs> you know? You know, and oh yeah, you know what I learned also like when we did the wastewater. So you guys know, uh, you get those packages that say, uh, those baby wipes and they say, those are not flushable. Right. They destroy the sewer system. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I found out, I didn't know. And we, um, so this was a year ago, so I have a five year old and yeah, we got baby wipes, you know, we probably were flushing them. I won't do it anymore. I won't do it because I saw, they showed me literally a giant vat of disgusting, smelly, old baby wipes that had clogged the system. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Wait, those baby wipes, you said flush them? Or you just they, they, the container, this package say flushable, mm -hmm. but what happens is they clog up the system and they mess the whole system up. So they're not really, it's not like they disintegrate. Yeah, yeah. So it's cool. That's one of the cool parts about the job. It almost like kind of makes you a little more like socially responsible in a lot of ways when you do stories like that, like, which is kind of cool, uh, you know, to learn and, and then, I don't know. I think that's one of the things I like about my job is that you figure this, some of this stuff out, you know, it's like, right? <laughs> Am I crazy? No. <laughs> about this piece where there were multiple people involved, right? So you have some, somebody who was specializing in being a videographer. Somebody yeah, was yeah. Producing, so that was, which is very rare. Most mornings it's me, my photographer, and my truck operator, the guy who like makes sure we get on TV, he does the satellite, da da da. I'm really like field producing myself. So I go in, I meet with the people who we are interviewing, make sure everything's cool, make sure the access is okay, and then I'll tell my photographer, okay, you know, start, like say it's an art, art gallery. Like last week, there's a, you guys know the Ramones, the rock band the Ramones? There was uh, the Queens Museum as an exhibit starting next week about the Ramones, which is cool, I'm a big fan. So, so we go in there, you know, hey, how's it going? Thanks for having us, da da da, kind of schmooze a little bit, get, make everybody comfortable, and then tell the photographer, okay, hey, you know, get some shots, you know, of all the exhibits, you know, get some close ups and some wide shots and this and that. And then, Make sure everything's tell you know. So then I, I tell my, my Dave, my truck op, who's like my buddy every day, I work with him every day. Like, all right, hey, let's uh, let's face that poster over there. It's really cool. Set it up that way. Is that okay? Does it work? Yeah. Okay. Good. You know, is the lighting okay? Da 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 da. And then go from there. This was like a special. I mean, this was the only difference here is that I had a producer, which is like the first time in my life I ever had a producer. <laughs> that was so. That was the only difference. And so. I had, and so, and my photographer was very hands-on. It was really his baby, this pro the project. So I had him and the producer telling me what to do, basically, which could be a little stressful sometimes, speaking of being nervous. Like, so when I was doing those stand-ups, a lot of times we had the PR people from whatever corporate entity we had. We had the representatives, like the sanitation you know, people. My photographer, my producer, and sometimes we'd have, a, sometimes we brought a second camera person with us, a volunteer, who, the guy who's in charge of our cameras came out with us and he got cutaways of all the stuff while they were shooting me. So a lot of times, which was cool, some of the other pieces, that you, you see me from the side too, and my stand-ups, which I'd never had that happen in my life, which was kind of cool. I was, wow, that's very professional. <laughs> you know, so, um, but yeah, so, but most mornings, I mean, it's, it's like me doing 18 jobs sort of, you know. And I've actually gotten in trouble, not in trouble, but a lot of times we'll have a brand new photographer and they'll forget to get a certain shot or something. That my, ma my managing editor is very strict about video. He's very, he's like kind of like a connoisseur. He, he wants certain shots. He hates art exhibits. He, he thinks it's too static. He wants a lot of moving, a lot of movement. And if we doesn't, he, it comes down on me. He's like, why didn't you tell your photographer to do that? Which is weird, it's never happened to me in my career. So I added to my duties now, not, ba I wanna call it babysitting, but I, now I, Instead of, <laughs> I used to just be very trusting of my photographer, especially if they were a veteran, someone who I'd been working with a lot. But if it's a new person, like today, like for instance, we were doing at the ice cream place, the guy was nice enough to provide us with these old archival fo fo photos that his dad had of the ice cream place like in the 60s. It was really cool. It looked totally different. So my photographer did a shot. So she put the, the, the pictures on the table and she just went like this. She did a pan. And then I watched it and I said, no. Oh. <laughs> like in a nice way, but I was like, 
I want each picture, a close up on each picture, this picture, this picture, this picture, this picture. You know, the pan, it's not going to work. I'm not going to be able to use it. So I'm glad I told her that because if I had not watched the video and then later on when I was putting my package together, I'd be like, shh, I have, I have nothing to, you, to work with. So, I, you know, that's another part of the job, the reporter. I'm learning more. I never was as, as hands-on until this new guy came in, a new boss. He's been there for about a year. But he's really, he's got me thinking about that. So my thing is like a balance. Like, I don't like to be like a jerk and like impending danger, a vulture over my photographer's head. I like to trust them and think that they know. But yesterday got an email. We're at the Yankees home opener, like I said. He sent me an email as I was on my way home on the train. Roger. This stuff is okay, but why is there not one wide shot of Yankee Stadium in your piece? And I was like, huh, that's a good point. No, but we need, so whose fault is it? Right. I should have told the photographer, get a wide shot of Yankee Stadium. Now, that being said, if you're a good photographer, you should know. Yankee Stadium is a famous place, right? It's a cathedral of baseball. Get a wide shot. It's huge. I assumed, and you know what happens when you assume, <laughs> I was wrong. So I'm learning, at, even at the age of 48, after doing this for like 25 years, I'm learning. You can't always try. But my thing is just do it in a nice way. I'm not like going to be, because I've seen some people out, in, some reporters out in the field screaming at their photographer, oh, God, what's wrong with you? Get that shot. What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm not going to do that. But I can gently, nicely say, like I did to this girl this morning, like, yeah. You could just please get the picture for me. Yeah. So, so it's a balance, right? Do with the, you know, it's all politics. You know, you want to like, you don't want to mess around with people and be, be, be jerk because you got to work with them the next day. But at the same time, if you're not on top of it, then I get in trouble with my boss. <laughs> so, you know, and that's what happened to me when I was news director upstate. I, I was the worst manager in the world. I'll never be a news director or a manager again, I swear, because my boss, my general manager, all he wanted me to do was come down on the reporters all the time and, 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 say, and tell them that what they're doing wrong. And it wasn't my nature. So then I became a bad employee because I wasn't, so thank God, you know, like I'm just like doing what I do. I, I don't want to be a boss ever again. I was terrible, you know? But, but some people are good at being boss. Like my boss is great at yelling at me. He's an expert because, and he's, but you know what? It stinks, but most of the time the story turns out better. Like, I hate it for a moment, and I'm like, oh, God, this guy every day. But the piece turns out, most of the time, it turns out better. Because he's smart. He's been doing it for a long time. He's read a lot of scripts. He's written a lot of scripts when he was, in the bit, uh, when he was doing it. And I got to trust him. So your first jolt reaction sometimes is going to be, oh, God, again. Like, I know this is funny. This is my, so when I send my, so I write my script in the morning. I usually write it on my phone, and I send it in. And he writes back, got it. And then this, this is the moment. What's going to happen? <laughs> is he going to approve it? Or is the phone number going to come up? It's him. Something's wrong with it. He's going to change it. He has a question. Oh, my God. What's he going to ask? What did I miss? And sometimes it's like, hey, it looks great. Edit one. Bye. And sometimes it's like, Roger, you talked about the, there were 30 Jan's ice cream places. Not as one left. Well, why did they all close? And that's what happened to me today. Why did they, why, why are there only one left? What happened to the other ones? I forgot. I didn't put it in. But then when I explained to him what the owner of the store said the reason was, he said, ah, I forget it. <laughs> you know what the guy said? He said that the reason they all closed is in the 80s, yogurt became pos very po popular and less people liked ice cream. And my boss was like, that's bullshit. Just forget it. <laughs> yeah, he, he actually said that. He's like, ah, forget it. So it went from me like thinking I was in trouble and then realizing, oh boy, I didn't explain why they all closed. Was it the economy? Was it yogurt? <laughs> and then it turns out that he was just like, ah, whatever, leave it. So he left it. But every day is an adventure. You guys are going to find that out. Like you just don't know. Like, you know, what, like they may ask the craziest question, you know, like, and I always like, I make sure before I leave anything, I get the number of my contact and I always say the same thing. Can I please call you in case my boss has a crazy question? <laughs> I say the same thing every day. Because I always say my boss has the one question that I forgot to ask. Every day. I, you, you know, and so even, like I said, you know, doing this for a long time, you still 
Go, sometimes you don't cover all your bases. Sometimes, sometimes you do. Sometimes he doesn't touch a word of my script. It's like, it's like Christmas. <laughs> and then sometimes he does major surgery. So it, you, and you can't let it um, like affect you. Like you have to have like more of a thick skin. Like because you, you'll go crazy if you like. I'm not going to fight with this guy every day. I'm going to trust that he's going to make my script better. That he knows what he's talking about, and I'm not going to take it personally. That's it. And then I read the script like he wrote it. Some of it's mine, some of it's now his. But the basically, you're still telling the story. Now, if there's something he says that I think is, that is absolutely wrong, then I'll say something. Like if he changes something factually. Like if he's like, uh, let's make it a, uh, instead of an ice cream parlor, let's make it uh, you know, a hot dog stand. Well, I'm going to be like, no, it's not a hot dog stand, it's an ice cream parlor. <laughs> right? <laughs> like it's a, so yeah, I would fight him. I mean, that's kind of a weird example, but I would fight him on that, right? You know. Most of the time, I know the night before. So, uh, and uh, <laughs> you guys, think, I try not to take away from my personal television time at night to study. Uh, every morning, I take a 15-minute cab ride to work. And that's when I do my research. And then when on the way to the location in the car, I, keep, I read up on it. And then try and know. And then when we get there at 6.15, we're going live around 10 after 7. Those, like, 45 minutes, I soak up everything from the person I'm talking to. I, I ask them the questions that I'm going to ask them anyway. So by the time I go on the air, it's like I know this. I, I, I'm an expert or whatever it is. So I try and I never want to like be in a situation where, I mean, I did call a guy named Merritt Merrill a few weeks ago, which was good. And luckily they were taping and they stopped it. That happens, right? It's going to happen. Because Merritt, I don't know the many Merritts, and I know Merrill Streep. So that's in my head, I was, it was, she, he was Merrill Streep. <laughs> I don't know why. But uh, yeah, I mean, but I try, yeah, but so I don't do like hours and hours of studying up on something unless it's something really complicated, like a political or something like that. But for the most, I mostly like in that little, that time in the cab and that time going to the location, I read up on it and then talking to them is really the best way to do it. Like I've seen some reporters have filled into my shift and like between, they've done their segment and they go in the truck and they hide and they come back. I'll never do that. I like talking. I want to know the people. I want to find out more about them. Like the guy today, the ice cream guy. All right, so he's the, he he's the owner of the ice cream store, right? I'm interviewing him. Hey, this is great. You own an ice cream shop. Turns out that his dad started it in 1970. His dad worked there for 10 years as a waiter after he came from Greece. He was an immigrant from Greece. Guy's a waiter for 10 years, and then the people are retiring. He buys the place. Now his sons are running it 57 years later. Uh, 40, but it was like, that's a great story. We got to talk about that. I didn't know about that when I showed up. Now, if I hadn't like schmoozed and got a little bit of a, a back and forth with him, I never would have found that out. And then he told me another great story that his dad, he, he went to Manhattan College, became an engineer, and he was going to get, but he wanted to keep helping at the store. And his dad fired him. He said to him one day, you're fired. I want you to be an engineer. Now, later he came back and took over the business. But how many people get fired by their dad? And his dad fired him because he wanted his son to have a better life than him. He didn't want him working at the restaurant all the time, seven days a week, 18 hours a day. What a great story. How cool is that? I never would have found that out if I was hiding in the truck. You got to talk. You know, you got to talk to people. And, 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 and that's part of being a, a journalist is, is getting to know people, you know, no matter who they are. They, you know, you just, yeah, and I feel like that helps. That's the best research. I can read every article about in the Times and every tweet or everything, but you talk, talking is the best. You find out everything. I just have my pad. I still carry a little reporter pad, always, and just beep, 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 beep. It's the best. I mean, that's, that, I feel like that's the best way to figure stuff out. It's interesting. So we, we were just reading um, about interviewing, like pre-interviewing versus not pre-interviewing, and, and you know, so, so should we do. The um, point was raised that if you do and it sounds like maybe you're having more of a conversation than like doing a more formal pre Oh yeah, no. Thing. But like the one possible disadvantage is that when you do the actual interview, then maybe it sounds more rehearsed and less spontaneous. Well, right, yeah, and I try and be very, sp I mean, you probably see me, I try and be very spontaneous about it. I mean, but I, I think most of the time I was talking to the guy at the restaurant today, we were talking about our kids and raising our kids and about baseball, about the Mets, so the Mets. You find little things that make them more comfortable 
um, what is it? There's a line in Goodfellas where the FBI guy says to um, uh, Ray Liotta's wife, he goes something about, if you're a happy witness, you're a good witness. Because they, they wanted them to turn against the, be, go government state and turn against the, the mobsters. To me, it's like, so I say, if you're a happy guest, you're a good guest. Like, I want them to be not nervous, in the great mood, and I try and, it's like, almost like I'm cheering them up. So it's not like I sit them down and I'm like, okay, we're going to talk about this. And here's the questions I'm going to ask you. I don't, you know, sometimes they request it. Sometimes people say, oh, what are you going to ask me? And I tell them, you know, I, I give them a little bit, but I don't tell them, you know, and I tell them, you know, and I do say, I'm not going to throw you any curveballs. And most of the time I'm doing light stuff, so I'm not going to try and, you know, take them off guard. But, but you want, like, you, that's a great point because, you, yeah, you don't want it to be too stale. Like, oh, we already talked about this. Right? I mean, you want it to be, and even today, like, I, th like, they didn't have a second guest for me this morning, so I talked to the owner twice. So I tried to shake it up. So after he mentioned to me the story about his dad, which I didn't know before the first one, I brought it up. I was like, what a great, and I was like, and this is, a, you know, not only are you guys the last Jan's ice cream parlor in New York City, but your family has been in the business for years, and your dad worked here before he owned it. How cool. And then he went into that, and that's a good story. So we didn't get touch of that in the first one. So I was able to, so if you're watching both segments, then you get a little, you're okay. Like it's not, you're not, you're not bored. You're not like, oh God, I just said this about an hour ago. You're getting a little bit of a different taste on things. And I also shook it up because the first one I had an ice cream soda and the second one I had an egg cream soda. <laughs> different. And then I went, <laughs> now I need to go jogging. Yeah, I know. I need to like lose 20 pounds after this morning's segment. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've been talking a lot, guys. I mean, it was tough. I mean, I, I have to confess that after my two years in Oneonta, I got homesick. I came home for a year. I was the secretary at a liquor distributor. I was making coffee and faxing and answering phones. I almost became a liquor salesman. I was that close. And thank God, I had sent a tape about three years earlier to Newburgh, W E. Uh, oh, I can't even remember the name. It was in Newburgh, New York, about an hour north. And they rescued me from making a mistake, not following my dream.